All right, so I'm going to uh, so remind you what is the program and where I am. So I, the, in the first lecture, we talk about what is the uh, standard optimal transport problem. We talk about the primal problem and the dual problem. And we gave an economic interpretation to the dual problem. We derived some basic properties. For example, we show that if the optimal transport cost function, the cost function is uh, metric, then optimal transport recovers a metric. And that metric is called the Wasserstein distance. I mentioned briefly, didn't prove, but mentioned briefly that Wasserstein distance, distance um, uh, uh, recovers the total variation distance and the, in the Prokhorov topology, the weak convergence topology. And we were talking about economics interpretations of the dual problem, and that's basically where I left off. Right? So now I'm going to go to that uh, part here, the economic interpretation. So I'm going to, uh, we, I talked about you know, primal and dual and how one can use the primal solution and complementary slackness to compute the dual optimizers, right? And the dual optimizers, for example, are important in economics because uh, dual optimizers actually are precisely the prices, correspond to the prices that, they, that need to be imposed such that in a decentralized way there is market equilibrium and that, uh, and that market's clear and that and the assignments of, of products with, uh, with agents uh, is done efficiently. So I'm going to give a little example of how, how this is done in one dimension. And I'm going to tell you, this is, a, this is, as I said, like my goal, as I said at the beginning of the lecture, is to talk about a model misspecification, all right? So at, at the moment, we haven't seen any model misspecification, but uh, we are going to be talking about the intuition of the optimal transport plan. So we are going to see the equilibrium equations and how to obtain the, the Munch map out of the equilibrium equations, interpreting them. And that is going to be important when we talk about uh, model misspecification. When we talk about, for example, the worst case distribution, the more adversarial distribution that can harm you the most, that's going to be an interpretation that I'm going to, uh, I'm going to leverage off this type of example so that you, so that I can explain to you what it is. Okay. All right. So, <clears throat> so I'm going to take this, uh, this is also a very nice book. Uh, if you want to learn about optimal transport use, use of optimal transport in economics, this is a book of a friend, Alfred Galichon. It's not, uh, not because he's a friend, it's like this is a really good book I, and I, I really like it. It's, it's a very concise and goes to the point, nice example. And then you, this is also a name that you see very often in, in, the, in economics and optimal, optimal transport, like Robert McCann, who is a, a Canadian uh, mathematical economist and and uh, he has like beautiful lecture notes about this. So these are good two pointers to actually look at these examples in economics. So let's think about the market. Uh, suppose that we want to, we want to study uh, labor market. So you have, uh, uh, you have um, uh, workers, right? You have labor, they have certain skills. They are indexed with, uh, with X. X are the characteristics of the worker. And you have companies that require certain skills to operate, right? So that's given by Y. So Y is like the technology. It's uh, some index of technology of a company, and X, X is the, is, uh, represents the quality or the education, the skill of the worker, right? So you have workers with a skill X, uh, companies with technology Y, and when you match uh, a worker X with a company Y, you get a surplus for the economy. The economy gets a surplus that is measured according to a function phi of X, Y. Okay, so we are thinking about now is, uh, you see, it's, it's like optimal transport, but instead of minimizing a cost, we are going to maximize a surplus. So think of phi as the negative of a cost. That's a surplus, okay? So everything is going to be, there is a negative sign, means will become max and so on. Okay, so now we are going to be modeling this. Uh, the, we are going to be modeling the population of workers as a continuum, like they have a density mu of x, and the, the population of the companies is modeled according to this density, density with respect to the Lebesgue measure, and the x and y are one-dimensional. So my goal is to compute. Remember, don't don't lose track of the goal. My goal is to compute explicit prices, so that you can see how to use the complementary likeness and and just get. More than just abstract intuition, get examples. Huh? Okay, so the salary of the worker is uh, going to be modeled with uh, this alpha x and beta y. And uh, remember that uh, the complementary is the, the, the dual constraint was in the case of costs, 
This, this is the price of uh, moving, transporting a pile of sand from John. That is the John and Maria, right, example. Alpha X plus beta Y less or equal for costs, but for surplus is, of course, greater or equal. So matching, you have this, is, this represents like salary, and this is the cost of technology, so that has to be, the cost has to be, uh, or the, the benefit, individual benefits, uh, have to be larger than the surplus. So that's kind of the, the it's just the, the same, the same um, variable, but uh, with the with, uh, with opposite sign, because uh, now we're talking about surplus, not costs. Okay? Alpha and beta are free variables, so they could be positive, negative. That's, that's not the problem. So now a, a, company, a company wants to minimize the production cost, so it wants to minimize the, the cost that it pays to workers. That's the labor. <coughs> Also want to minimize the price, the, the cost uh, of, uh, of having that technology, you know, maintaining that technology, buying the technology, etc. So the company now wants to minimize the total production cost subject to this uh, constraint. Okay. Now this is the dual problem of uh, there, there is there is some Munch-Kantorovich problem as primal, right? Because like the, the dual was alpha plus beta less than cost subject to maximizing this. Because, because we have multiplied everything by minus, this does correspond to the dual. This is a, I'm starting from the dual. And in economics problems, most of the time you start from the dual. For an economist, when he tells you about the dual of an optimal transport, he actually thinks of the mathematical, for him the primal is the dual, the mathematical dual of the Kantorovich problem. This is typically how it's presented. In these books of Ga Alfred Galichon, for example, Lots of examples are just uh, starting from the dual optimization problem and interpreting it, right? So the, an economist is interested in this, in the dual, because he's interested like in equilibrium. The, he's, he wants to show that there, is, there are equilibrium prices that achieve equality here, and, uh, and because alpha x plus beta y is greater or equal to phi, x, phi xy, then, and, and you want to minimize, alpha x has to be larger than phi minus beta. And the best uh, lower bound is when you take the supremum. And so you have equilibrium happens when, when equality holds, when you, do, when you do the assignment and everybody's happy and the equality holds. So if, if we, you, we can uh, have uh, alpha and x to be the price of labor and the price of technology, so just let the market sort of decide what are the prices and sort of let the market clear and see what happens. Or you can have a central planner, sort of uh, the government, saying, okay, you know, workers with, this me with these skills actually must be working for this type of, uh, of uh, technology companies or, you know, companies with certain type of technology. So the uh, um, strong duality tells you this is equivalent, right? So if you wanted to maximize the total surplus of the economy subject to the constraint that you, uh, that you clear the markets, all the labor market gets clear uh, with these assignments, and all the technology market right gets clear. So that would be the optimization problem that the central planner needs to, you know, proposes. And so he he will have to solve this, maximize this, and then the assignments. These are randomized assignments. We accept randomized assignments. Right. This is one of the situations in which it would be nice if you had matchings, not randomized assignments, but just say, you know, you go to that company, etc. Right. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick, this is a cost function that is a favorite of the economists. This is in one, like for one dimensional quantities, but they, they use it a lot. And you, you see this in, in, uh, in pricing problems in machine learning. Uh, in multi-dimensions, that would be the inner product of X and Y. Basically, you want, um, if you think in multi-dimensions, you want, you want to maximize surplus. And, they, and the, the surplus function is X times Y or X transpose Y. You want to promote uh, things that are similar. So you want to match X and Y and X and Y are similar. So this would be also a good model, for example, matching, uh, you know, couples. Or, you know, you have X and Y that are similar, like uh, things, people who like the similar, similar things. So that's, that would be, this is why the motivation of X times Y, right? So a large X and a large Y. Uh, so let's say, for example, in this context, I'm saying I'm, a, I'm modeling a market where the, the population, the skills are uniformly distributed in the index 0, 1. So everybody has the same, you know, the, the, the skills, they don't have any particular um, 
sort of uh, uh, bias towards uh, the economy doesn't have particular bias towards certain type of workers. All, all the workers are uniformly distributed on the skills uh, range. And I'm modeling a situation in which the, you have this, uh, the, the workers are uh, distributed according to this exponential model. So basically, you know, higher, more technology, uh, the, the distribution of the workers is less and less and less, right? So exponentially decaying the, in the technology level, you have less and less and less companies, right? So now we would like to see what would be the price, what would be the equilibrium price in such a way that the market's clear and that uh, they will be the equivalent to assigning centrally the, the, the uh, population, okay? So the way in which uh, we are going to do it is first, we are going to use uh, a, a trick that is, uh, that is common. And, uh, and you know, you, you, once you get uh, uh, more familiar, uh, I could have started with the differential equations, but I want you to see it more intuitively, how to solve this problem. Suppose that I am going to solve this problem by sampling, okay? Suppose that I, I sample a population of size N workers uh, out of the distribution mu and a population of size N workers out of the distribution V, which is exponential, right? So these are distributions that uh, are continuous distributions, so I have X and Y. And if these are my population, this, this is, I have N individuals with these characteristics in my population, then it's very easy to match. It's very easy to find the, the optimal transport uh, solution, right? In this case, obviously what, what you should do is you should rank the skills of the companies, the Ys, and you should rank the skill of uh, Xs and match because my, my function is X times Y. So the best, the best uh, matching is, the, you know, rank them and matching according to the rank, right? So, so to solve this optimization problem for this particular problem, uh, in fact, the, there is a Monge solution, which is a matching type solution. And is given by sorting the, the values, Xs and Ys, the, the observations, and actually matching them. You're going to Monte Carlo because direct, direct solving is harder? Because, well, direct solving is easy once you realize what you need to do. But, uh, but this is obvious, right? This is like you, you agree that this is a very obvious solution, right? So simply sort and match is the solution. Okay, so now, um, how do you, what, you, you can also, if, if you think in terms of simulation, you can think of uh, Y as a realization of some uniform, right? You could have uh, taken the, this is a way to simulate an exponential random variable, it's negative of log. And this is, uh, so this is the inverse of the uniform, right? And now the X's I told you there were uniform, so you can think of X's being exactly the uniforms. And because this is a monotone transformation, you get it, that's it. So that already gives you the coupling, right? So the coupling is you take, uh, you take the X variable that's uniform and apply the inverse CDF, and that gives you where you should map the guy. That's called the monotonic coupling. And if you send the sample size to infinity, then you get the optimal coupling, right? So, so then you, this, is, this gives you the optimal coupling, x is equal to u, and y equal to minus log of one minus u. There is nothing special about the uniform. I could have assumed any other distribution, and x would have been f inverse, just as this one is the inverse CDF of the uniform, this would have been the inverse CDF of whatever my mu was, right? So that, that's cool, that gives you the optimal transport plan. So that gives you the optimal pi, right? Um, so that's, that's the general, the optimal coupling for this, uh, for the central planner. The central planner, if he, he observes an individual and then he sends uh, the individual, he computes minus log of one minus the, the skill of that individual and then he sends him to, and he tells, he tells him, okay, this is the company you need to work for. And he assigns everybody like that, okay? So in general, as I say, like that. But, uh, but if the central planner doesn't want to do that and he wants to kind of co compute prices, now what are the prices that I need to impose or you know, what are the prices that the economy uh, reaches so that you can achieve the same equilibrium? That's alpha and beta. Okay, so how do you compute those things? Okay, so, so <clears throat> first of all, this, this technique uh, really requires this property of, of uh, phi. It is called supermodularity. So it means that uh, if I give you pairs X and Y, you are better off 
if you compare the surplus that you get pairing x and y and x prime y prime, you are better off by first sorting, assign the maximum to the maximum, then the minimum to the minimum, that increases the value function. This is the definition of supermodularity in this case. And the, a, a sufficient condition to check supermodularity is not hard to convince yourself is like the second derivative, partial derivative x and y has to be non-negative. Whenever that happens, whenever you have this condition, then the solution is exactly the same. Sort and, uh, and, and match. Sorry? Common autonomic coupling means exactly this. Uh, this x, if you, if you think of x as f inverse of a uniform, and the y is the f inverse of a uniform, the u is the same, that's the same, that's exactly right. So this respects the marginal distributions and is always the solution of the optimal transport plan when phi is supermodular, when the cost function is supermodular. So cost functions are negative of cost, so if you express it in terms of the cost function, sorry, the surplus function is supermodular, so that means the cost function is submodular. So as a corollary, if you, if you uh, just work in the space of distributions or you take, you know, things like that, like that, you can put a square here, something on the, with the power p, all of these are submodular cost functions. You take the derivative twice and it's, uh, it's not negative. So for all of these, the optimal coupling is the same, is this. And so, and so therefore, you know, you, this is a formula that you see as a corollary, you get you, get, you, you want to compute the, the norm, right, of the, the expectation, the expectation of x and y. Well, x is f inverse of u, y is f inverse of, of u, but with different f's, f of mu and f of v. And you compute the expectation in terms of the uniform random variable. This is a formula that you often see for optimal transport in one dimension, with the Wasserstein distance. This is the formula you wiggle Wikipedia, Wasserstein distance in one dimension, you see this formula. So it, it's explained like this. Yes. Yes, somebody was asking a question. No? Okay. I had a side question. Yes. So all of optimal transport seems to be about two distributions. You know, two random variables, you have marginal, then you have differential. Right. Why not change? Oh, no, there is also something called the fresh air version that uh, where you kind of want to put multi, exactly. you want, you, oh, this is very useful. This is useful, for example, in, Risk analysis, if you want to kind of see what's the impact of the correlation structure in some risk computation, that's exactly the calculation. You keep your marginals and you estimate what's the worst case coupling. This is a well-developed theory. Oh, this is a, there is a, there is a well-developed theory for the, for um, duality and strong duality and all of that, but it's very hard uh, to compute that stuff. There is the rearrangement algorithm of Ruschendorf, and this is a classical problem in OR, and we can, you know, I can tell you more about that, but uh, yes. Um, so this thing is going to be infinity if these do not have finite mean. But, uh, but you still could, you still can compute. I mean, I didn't, it's just going to be infinity. Like it, it, you, end up, you might end up happen, saying that, the, that the, the Wasserstein distance is infinity if it doesn't have finite mean. Yes, that could happen. But, but you see in my derivation, I really didn't use uh, the finite mean. Okay, so similar identities for other ones, if you put p and, and that. Okay, so this is something that, that explains. All right, so now how do you go from the, the optimal coupling to the optimal prices policy? Well, here, here are some differential equations that you can obtain. So for example, look at, um, if you look at this, this would be the, the solution of the, in, in, in equilibrium, right? Um, be, if you, beta, this says beta prime. Beta prime stands for derivative respect to y, right? So ignore the prime. Uh, this beta, you get beta equal to the sup of phi minus alpha. Remember, this came from, from the fact that uh, this was the primal, right? So beta is phi minus alpha here, and beta has to be greater or equal, right? So beta has to be, wants to be minimum because you want to minimize. So the best uh, thing you can do lower bound is take the supremum, right? And it's tight in, the, in equilibrium. So that's why it comes, that's why you, you get this equation with the supremum because that's the, that's, this is the solution in equilibrium, that's beta star. If you ignore the derivative, it's the supremum. Now, this, when you solve this optimization problem, there is going to be, you see the supremum over x, given a y, there is a supremum over x, you get an xy here. So that's the optimal solution, that's the arc sup 
of, uh, of this optimization problem, depends on why. That turns out to be the assignment. That is actually the matching guy. That's the one, you, you observe this y, and you send him to x, y, which is the arc soup of this. That's the transportation, it goes in that direction, right? In this problem, because it's going to be a munch map, this solution is going to be unique, and you can take the derivative of this function, and there is uh, this tool that is used a lot in economics called the envelope theorem, right? And uh, so they, it tells you, you, know, you, you, can, you can basically ignore the soup, forget about it, take the derivative as if the soup didn't exist, and, uh, but once you are done taking the derivative, whenever you see x, plug in the optimizer of x. That's what the envelope theorem says. It's very easy to prove if you have the right differentiability conditions. So now you see uh, you have beta prime of uh, y in equilibrium is equal to x of y, but you also know how, what's x of y. You know that, uh, that give me a y, then you, you take the inverse function here uh, of minus log of 1 minus x, that gives you the x. So you have a beta prime of y equal to 1 minus exponential of minus y. Now you integrate. You integrate and you, you obtain the beta. And, um, and um, e, this is the complementary slackness condition. So you have alpha star of x plus beta of y, but you need to plug in why y is. y is minus log of 1 minus x. That's equal to x times y. So you didn't have to do the sampling thing. You could have looked at the complementary slackness and, and look at these equations and just guess what is alpha and beta. Right. Or better, you can derive this uh, uh, differential equation, but you, you would have to guess what's the optimal coupling. This is, the, this is kind of the way. This is a technique. This is called, these are, in economics, are called the labor equations. Okay? So now that's kind of like, I, I love this example that is, is very neat. Those are the, these are actually the salaries. This is the salary of the, of, of the worker, and, and this is the, the cost of the technology right, to obtain equilibrium. Okay, so if you look at the, ah, so you can do things like economists love this thing. Like if you, if you change the surplus function in a way that, uh, for example, only accept only uh, the, uh, the, there is a shock in, in, the, in the economy, and now the surplus gets affected, now in this way with f of x, uh, then in this context, uh, the derivative with respect to, if you go here, the derivative with respect to y, right, this, this thing gets killed. So you integrate, that's the, if productivity changes, then uh, in this way, then uh, this is the price of uh, the technology, right? So price of technology will, be, will not be affected, but the price of uh, labor will be accept, affected. So a shock of this form will affect salaries, but not technology costs. Uh, okay, so I think, Let's see, one to, I have half an hour. Okay. Um, so this is something that I probably, that's kind of interesting to see. Uh, somebody uh, asked about Kantorovich duality. Yes, there you go, Ganesh. Okay, so here is uh, um, what happens there, right? So, so in, in economics, oh, for, I think it's better to, first I, I say something, uh, sorry, I should have. Uh, okay, I'll do it up in that order. All right, so um, part of the name of the game here uh, is, involves understanding the dual variables. The problem, the dual variables are this alpha and beta. And uh, you see, once you've postulate this optimal transport problem, for example, I'm going to give you a sense of what I type of, of simplifications you, you, can, you can impose on the dual variables and why they are useful. So, for example, if you want to compute Wasserstein distances, uh, the, the, op, the dual of the optimal transport problem, remember, is this, is this max of alpha plus beta. Since beta is a free variable, I can use plus or minus. So it's convenient to use minus here, right? but it doesn't matter. So this is in a standard form, the dual of the, of the problem, right? Now, I, I, I already did it before. Like, if you, if you, gave, me, if you gave me a beta, I can improve the, the function because I want to maximize, right? So that means alpha has to be less or equal to d of x plus y. So that has to hold for every pair x and y. So by taking the infimum, I get the best possible upper bound for the purposes of maximizing, right? So, so I, I, this, give me a beta, I can choose an alpha this way. Okay? This, this, no matter what your alpha was, this, 
this manufactured beta, uh, or which, is, which takes the role of your alpha, that's actually the best thing you could do, given that beta, right? So once, uh, if, if you had chosen alpha, I could also improve the following, you know, by, by exactly the same way. Uh, I would, uh, if you gave me alpha, I would put uh, um, the alpha minus d, and I would take the supermoon, right? So it's, it's, I'll just put it on the other side, and I pick the best bound. Right? So you could continue improving this way, right? But it turns out this, uh, this is cy cyclic. It stops after three times. So it's, that's not difficult to see, but the point is that, for example, let's take this one, yes? You see, once you have this function, it's not difficult to see that this is a Lipschitz function. It's one Lipschitz with respect to this metric. Uh, you just compute b of x and minus b of x prime. You apply the definition of this is the optimizer, the arc max of uh, when you plug in x, and this is the arc max when you plug in x prime. And because this is infimizer, this is this y x is minimizer. If you plug in the y x prime here, then uh, you you just make this value worse because this was the minimum. So you plugging in y x prime actually just increase the value here. And um, and so now you cancel the b y b y x prime and beta y x prime here, and you have d of x y x and d x y x prime. And this statement is nothing but the triangle inequality. So you put it on the other side, and you say e x y x prime, x x prime, and from x to y x prime. So then you see that this is a Lipschitz function, right? So just doing this calculation once makes you Lipschitz. So that means that it's enough to look for solutions that are Lipschitz one, because whatever you gave me, beta, I am going to do this transformation to improve the objective function, and this already gives me a Lipschitz function. And when I plug it in for the alpha, it's the same argument, it gives me Lipschitz function. So first simplification, just need to look at alpha and beta that are Lipschitz. Can you keep on doing this? It, it's cyclic. In three times, you stop. You just don't improve anymore. OK, but uh, now, um, so beta, clearly beta is less or equal to this. Beta, the transform beta is less than beta, right? If beta was a Lipschitz function, this, was, this is my alpha, right? This is my transformation. If, if, uh, if this is now your alpha, if you plug in a, a Lipschitz function and we have agreed that this is what makes sense to plug in, uh, you see Lipschitz means that beta of x minus beta y is less than d of x, y. So on one hand, this beta d, which is a transformation, is less than beta because you can always plug in y equal to x. On the other hand, when you take the difference of this, beta d minus beta, you just insert the value of what this means here because this is Lipschitz. The, this value cannot be larger than dxy. So this is greater or equal to zero. So that means that beta of d is equal to beta. You have both. So that means that beta is equal to alpha. Whenever you plug in, so, so that, that means that the, the solution really is this problem is equivalent to saying maximize alpha, expected value of alpha minus expected value of alpha with mu and v, subject to alpha being one Lipschitz. This is called Kantorovich duality, okay? Now, it's, it's used in, in, the, in AI as a basis for what is called the Wasserstein GAN. It's, uh, you know, you get these pictures. Those are, those are, this, is, this is really, really cool technology because, uh, so these pictures are actually pe pictures of people that do not exist, by the way. This is the cool thing. These people do not exist. The machine generated these samples at random out of training sets you know, of, of pictures. So they, they look at this uh, very large class of images of people who are good looking, and somehow the machine learns what good looking means and starts producing these sort of things, right? Anyway, so how do they do it and what's the connection? Well, once you, if you want to parameterize distributions, right, so they introduce this uh, neural network that, that is one to approximate, and the, and the, they, they use this uh, uh, kantorovich rubinstein duality. You, you want to create neural networks that, that, uh, where you impose uh, in all of these, in these functions, like the Lipschitz one condition. And these are the parameters of the, of the network that produces images. So this is going to create images out of Gaussian distributions moving forward. And this is a network that is going to discriminate these values. And by iterating this uh, min max, and uh, you, you get these are the, you know, you get these algorithms. Okay. Okay, so I am going to skip this case, which is the Brenier case. Uh, 
and I am going to. Um, so okay, so that's um, uh, okay. So you are forcing me to talk a little bit about this. It's okay. That's because that's a, that's a very natural question, and the question that you, that uh, you are asking has to do with basically what type of a structure I can can I obtain now that I, that can guide me to my choice of the primer, right? So here, for example, in my very first example. I, in the example that I show you of the labor markets, I have this function x times y. And I say, you know, this has this property of, uh, of being um, a, this is super modular or submodular, right? So in, in general, the sort of, uh, the sort of uh, everything, like the, the, most the, the most interesting case from the standpoint of learning this theory is, is what is called the Brenier case. So the Brenier case is, it's actually, in fact, the case that uh, Munch posed. <laughs> he was interested in this problem. Then, you know, mathematicians created this, all this theory. But there, he was interested in this cost function, this particular one. This cost function is a beautiful one because um, once you have, if you have uh, finite uh, second moments for the marginals, once you expand, expand this uh, second, this uh, inner product square, you get, uh, you get that the problem is equivalent to this x transpose y. So this is like the economist, the economist problem. That's the surplus function, okay? And if you look at, for example, now, so this is now the optimal transport problem. This is in the primal space, okay? Now, uh, what is the type of a structure that, uh, that the dual can be used to impose on the primal solution? That's, your ask, that's the question you are asking, right? You're asking, okay, now you find some structural alpha, like one leap shoots, whatever, right? Can you tell me about the structure of the primal out of that stuff, right? Yes, I can tell you, but uh, it's going to be a generalization of the following. So in this case, let me, let me switch, switch gears and, and show you what happens here. Okay, so you have this, uh, you have this uh, cost function now, x transpose y, and this is the dual, okay? All right, so now the same trick I told you before, like this trick of improving, right? So just uh, look at the equation alpha plus beta, and uh, noting that you want to minimize, so you want to you want to pick the best upper bound, the, you know the best the best bound. So so this is very similar reason. You know you take the soup. Now you realize this is a convex function, right? So you started from from whatever from alpha, and again from whatever you alpha you improve, you get a convex function. And you could have done the same for beta. So for this problem, the optimal solution would be pick convex functions. But now you can go something more general. I can give you a more general convex function, more general cost function or surplus function here. And now you can talk about C convex. Is the C convex, is the Psi convex, et cetera, or the Psi transform, C transform. So just take the convex case, this case, and use the language of convex analysis to just uh, explain what happens with the, with the, with the transport, right? Now, one thing with this, uh, with uh, uh, this um, uh, case, what happens is that uh, you have a rich theory of, uh, of uh, convexity, right? So you know that uh, if you give me a function alpha, which is, uh, for example, a lower semi-continuous uh, convex function, and you took the dual, right? You, well, this, this equality happens uh, almost surely uh, under, under the, if alpha star is and alpha are the optimal solutions because of complementary slackness. But you also have properties, for example, uh, if you remove this almost surely, just the fact that these are convex functions, this happens if uh, y is a subgradient of alpha, right? And, the, uh, and also if you take the subgradient of alpha star of y, this equality happens if it's x is in the subgradient of alpha star. And, but if these are convex functions, so if um, they, they will be differentiable almost everywhere, right? Uh, by Rademacher's theorem. So if the marginal distributions, for example, were uh, have density, then that means that this happens almost everywhere with respect to the, to, to the problem, like to the, to the input of the problem. And therefore, you know that the optimal transport plan has to be always be the gradient of convex function. Okay, so that's the type of, and this is in general, as long as you have, as long as you have this sort of equality, then uh, for, for the C convex, or whatever the extension is for convexity, you can always make this, this sort of claim, okay? So that's the sort of, this is, how, this is how you can translate properties about the optimizers into properties of the 
properties of the dual optimizers into properties of the prima. Okay. So I'm, this is this was useful to have this piece, these slides. All right. So let me let me just go back and tell you what is it that we wanted to do. Uh, sorry. So yeah, this is the program for the lectures. I've been I have introduced to you the optimal optimal transport very very briefly, but I think we we have covered a fair amount. We have covered proof techniques, what's the optimal transport problem, economic interpretations, some nice way of actually clearing markets, computing exactly the prices, for example. Uh, talked about Wasserstein distances, Kantorovich duality, how Kantorovich duality is used in the context of, uh, of uh, you know, machine learning and, and AI. Now I'm going to talk about how to use optimal transport for applications in machine learning, and in operations research, okay? That's, uh, that's where we are going. So we are going to leverage up all of the intuition that we have now about optimal transport, and we are gonna put it to use in, in some OR problems. All right, so I am going to start with, uh, yes, I'm going to start with a, one application that is very, uh, common in, in applied probability. So these are diffusion approximations, okay? So this is based on this paper uh, that uh, looks at uncertainty quantification using optimal transport. So I'm now interested in performance analysis, not optimization yet. Optimization is going to come later in the applications to machine learning. So at the moment I just want to, to compute uh, an expectation, expectation of interest for some complex model that I'm denoting as P true. So this model perhaps is unaccessible, perhaps you don't have enough information, or perhaps it's just extremely hard to use to compute the expectation of interest, right? Uh, more of, later on, we're going to be interested in, in controlling or optimizing a performance measure that is of, of uh, like minimizing an expectation of some loss. So what we, what's, what's the modeling cycle? I started talking these lectures about, you know, I started talking about the modeling cycle. So modeling cycle involves finding a model that uh, trades uh, fidelity and tractability, and then fitting that model, get, uh, use it, sort of uh, assume it's correct, and then have some prescription or just compute this quantity, right? So what we're going to do in order to, uh, to quantify the error in this, uh, in this estimation problem is we're going to introduce, we're going to compute a bounds, could be upper and lower bounds. So I'm going to concentrate on upper bounds, like for risk. So we want to, we're interested in computing what's the worst case bound of this expectation of some function, y, uh, over all probability models that are within, within Wasserstein distance or optimal transport cost uh, of size delta. Now, I, I am interested in situations where uh, the random variables take values on a, on a poly space or say they are, uh, you know, general because I, what I want to, to do is I want to apply this sort of bounds in these types of results in situations where you have a diffusion approximation. So you have a model, perhaps a queuing model, complicated queuing model, where you have data is discrete but you are going to use Brownian motion because it's easy to compute quantities of interest. And these quantities of interest might be sample path quantities of interest, right? Solutions of a stochastic differential equation or something like that. So that is kind of the, the type of environment that motivates this level of generality. Now, if you look at this, uh, this program, it, it looks very challenging and, and it, is, it, is, uh, it is a little intimidating because uh, it's a linear programming problem in infinite dimensions once again. So the, the decision here appears to be P, but you can expand the decision to talk about, in the end, P is going to be coupled with P0 <coughs> through the optimal coupling, and this is, the optimal coupling is the minimizer of this. So if the optimal coupling is less than delta, then there exists a coupling, namely the optimal one, that is less than delta. So you can relax this problem right in this way. Right, so in terms of the joint distribution. So you pick uh, the, the optimization problem is over all joint distributions such that the marginal of Y is P0 and that the cost is, uh, is uh, the cost of transportation is less than delta and you want to maximize this. Now this, this is a very silly way of writing this integral, of course, because 
this is integrating over x and y, and this f depends only on y. That's okay, because uh, you first integrate x, and because of this uh, constraint, well, that, that just gives you the, the, the integration on, on, uh, on y, here, right? So this, um, this, recovers the, this recovers the same formulation. Now this, I'm not going to tell you about how to prove the strong duality of this. I gave you a flavor of how to do it in compact spaces. So using the Sion's uh, min-max theorem, you can show that this has a strong duality, at least in compact spaces. And then I'm going to just leave it at that. Okay. Yes. This is supposed to be a Y because I'm going to be using the convention that whenever I call P0, the random variable attached to P0 is X, and the random variable attached to P is Y. Okay, so, but this again is a, is a standard LP, at least formally, so you can compute the dual, right? So it's almost in a standard form, but uh, you have this less or equal, and so that is going to imply that the Lagrange multiplier corresponding to this constraint is positive, no longer free. So you write the linear program, so, so you are infimizing over alpha uh, times delta, and the, there is the Lagrange, there is the dual variable corresponding to this constraint, so it's alpha P0, you are going to add them up, so you have alpha X P0 DX, and so now you have uh, the, the constraint, this is a maximizer, so the dual is going to be an infimum, and you have greater or equal constraints. Okay, so that's how the dual, formal dual looks like. In compact spaces, it's easy to check it's correct, and that in general, this, this uh, always has no duality gap. So in Polish spaces, uh, all what you need is the F to be uh, upper semi-continuous, the C lower semi-continuous, so this is the same level of generality as the standard optimal transport theory. So you can basically always use it, fine. Okay, so now, uh, now this is the solution of the dual because you, you see you want to infimize alpha and alpha is larger than F minus lambda C. So the best bound is to take the supermoon, that's what you plug it in, so that's the solution, okay? So the this problem is now a one-dimensional, in principle, optimization problem, assuming you can compute this quickly, or you know, fast, or in closed form, whatever, right? But uh, this is basically the, the solution. So now, going back to optimal transport and the intuition interpretation, what's going on here, right? This, this solution typically, not always, but typically, will correspond to the, the worst-case measure. If you have a munch map, if you have a munch map, uh, then it, that means is if this supermoon, if this optim, optimization problem has a unique optimizer soup, unique soup, then what uh, this is the this is assuming that you compute the optimal alpha, right? This is telling you this optimization problem is telling you where to send x. So that is the munch map. Is the worst case distribution is actually given by a munch map. So you compute the arc soup, and that's that's where the distribution y is supported of y, right? If you start from a problem x that is discrete, for example, sample-based problem, then it's nice that, uh, that uh, this was formulated in a, continuous, in a continuous framework, you see? I didn't pull, I didn't impose, I didn't pre, predispose like any information the support of the worst case distribution, and that actually came up really handy here, because then that means there is no constraint here, and I sometimes can solve this optimization problem uh, in closed form, you will see. Right, in a minute. Okay, so this is, this thing, um, I'm gonna call this, I'm going to refer this multiple times to robust performance analysis duality. Robust performance analysis, ROPA. ROPA. ROPA in Spanish means clothes. Okay, so it's the clothing, it's the clothing theorem, clothing result, right? So this, I'm going to show you now simplifications in machine learning. We're going to be using this to do the following. I'm going to show you how to compute the worst case distribution in, in the context of uh, ruin probabilities, ruin calculations for Brownian motion. So we are going to do it in that level of generality for random variables that are infinite dimensional. Then I'm going to be solving linear regression problems where I want to find like a parameter and introducing this worst case measure. We're gonna be using this result to compute what's the worst case sort of uh, the adversarial, uh, 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 estimation problem that you would solve if you wanted to estimate in a robust way 
linear regression to protect against uh, uh, adversarial changes to your data, for example. And we are going to be using it to interpret uh, this like novel artificial example uh, examples that have been uh, given recently for adversarial adversarial training of neural networks. All of this is going to come from this result. Okay. Uh, so to gain intuition about this result and to just convince you that this can be computed in in close form in many, many interesting cases. I'm going to consider the case of an important case. So the case where the, the quantity of interest I want to robustify is a probability. So when f of y is the indicator of y in some set, okay? So what, how this uh, result looks like in that case, uh, you st this is the supremum of the indicator function of y in the set A, and I have lambda times c of x y, okay? So, um, if f of y then is, is just an indicator function, uh, then you realize that, uh, that you want to optimize here, there is no point in picking something that is zero because this is just going to be negative. So the inner player here, this y, only is going to pick y's that are in the set A. So you get this uh, one minus lambda times c of, x, c of ax, and because this has a negative sign and he wants to optimize, he's gonna try to pick the one that makes this quantity smaller the element y that makes this quantity smaller. So first y has to be in A and makes this quantity smaller, right? And so you arrive to this, uh, to this equation. This gets simplified to just this, this quantity here. Um, so now this, from here to here, all what, I, what, what is going on here is I take the derivative. It's just, it's a one-dimensional calculation where I have the lambda. You can almost perhaps do it in your head here you know, just take the derivative and, and just simplify and you get this expression here. Where the lambda, the lambda, of course I, I, I need some continuity, but uh, if this CAX, which is this random variable, this is basically the distance uh, from X to the set Y. Is the projection using this cost function. Is the shortest distance from the set A to the point X. X is my random sample. And uh, now the delta here you can compute using a stochastic approximations. For example, if you can, you have the ability to sample P0 and compute the distance, the projection from the point X that you observe to the set A, then you are in good shape to compute this by stochastic approximations. So you could, now you, could, you can compute. So the, what you, delta is given to you, I'll tell you how. Lambda star is the, is the Lagrange multiplier that you need to compute by solving this fixed point equation. You can apply the stochastic approximations. Once you have that, then you can compute what's the worst case probability. All what you need is to be able to compute these projections from X to the set A using this geometry. Okay? We are in the same page, yes? So it's kind of, it's a pretty, it's a, it's a very neat, I think, uh, way because uh, P0 is supposed to be a tractable model. That's why you picked it. Right? Okay. Cx x equal to zero means the transporting from x to x costs you nothing. So moving a point from x to x is, has no cost. That's the interpretation. Sorry? No, it's like uh, it's the, the Euclidean distance from x to x. Is the, I mean, you can think of distance, but you can think of just cost. The cost of transporting from x to x is not, the cost of not moving is zero. That's the interpretation. It's a very natural, I mean, I don't know, I agree, but maybe you know, the cost of not moving could be $5, but uh, who, who would pay that? <laughs> Just don't, don't move. <laughs> yes. Okay, so now let's look at the application of this in, the, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a kind of like a stochastic process level context. So let's say this is a classical question in applied probability. This is an applied probability workshop, so this is probably a good example to look at. So let's say you want to compute the reserve of a company, right, has, a, it could be in D dimensions, and you want, this is a quantity, is the probability that, uh, that the reserve process hits some level B at some point. So this level B could be zero. So the reserve, you know, goes to zero. In multiple lines of business, it depends on what you, what the regulator allows you to go from, to pass, you know, transfer from one company to another. Let's say one dimension, just, you know, this, comp this reserve hits zero. So this set models bankruptcy, right? And, the, and this model, the true model, might be very complex, could be intractable, you just have data, it's, it's difficult to, to compute. 
Okay, so um, one solution is by is instead of you know compute the risk or the probability of bankruptcy by finding a bound on this this probability. So you can use, for example, P zero as uh, as um, any model could be Brownian motion. You can model the the reserve process according to some Brownian motion and and compute this. Now, a few years ago, I used to give talks about you know using heavy tail distributions and Gaussian models and light tail distributions and why you should not be doing using a light tail distribution for a heavy tail calculations and so on. And so I actually did this kind of breaking those rules. So I, I am going to show you simulations where the reserve process is actually a heavy tail process, like just you have uh, claims that are Pareto with some, with some index, and I nevertheless use Brownian motion. And let's see what happens. Okay, so P0 is, uh, is my proxy for the true. And um, delta, I'll, I'll tell you how to choose that later. Okay, uh, so. Are you suggesting that P0 is in the arbitrary or it's something I'm saying that this is, this is fairly robust to even like uh, naive choices. As long, I'm, so what the message is going to be the cost function fixes the problem if you choose it right. So how to pick the cost function at the end of this talk? I'm going to talk about open problems, and one of them is how to pick the cost function. And my claim is that that actually helps a lot. You can have your proxy model, but uh, the cost function, if the cost function actually has features that protect you for the question of interest, you have come a long way. In a way, the theorem is that with P0, you solve this problem, then you take a supremum of P0. Yes. That's also about the same. Right, and if the supremum is actually sort of uh, assigning very high cost to a stuff that is not interesting and relatively low cost to a stuff that is interesting. That is what interesting means. You should think of this, you should think of this formulation. This guy is your consultant, right? He tells you what if. You endow your consultant with, with, uh, with attributes. Those attributes are in the cost function. And now go and tell him, okay, just figure out what if. This is my prescription, P0 is my benchmark, and now go figure out what if. So if you endow the guy with the right attributes, he's gonna tell you, okay, this is the worst that can happen, everything, and he's gonna be right. I mean, he's going to be looking for the worst that can happen that is realistic. That's just endowing him with the right attributes means not asking him what's the worst that can happen and go and he gives you an answer that is just too pessimistic, basically. He just gets it right. That's the point. Okay, so, um, yes. P true and P zero. P, oh, this this P is a, this this suprem, supremum is uh, is over P. P is the decision variable. Oh, this is a typo. Sorry, this should be P. So this should be P only, not P true. Sorry, my apologies. So this should be super over P. Yes, thank you. Otherwise, it doesn't depend. Yes. All right. So uh, so you could, for example, in this example of uh, of diffusion approximations, I'm going to talk a little bit about this because this. You also ask about uh, Hans and Sargent. Okay, look, in this example, you cannot use this type of, of way of measuring the discrepancy in the models. Because if you, data is discrete. If you insist in using Brownian motion, this, the model that you are using is, is singular with respect to the data. So this distance is going to be infinity. So you can't, that, that is just not very sensible. Right? The delta would have to be infinity. So that's why, that's why one of, this is one of the reasons why I like this Wasserstein distance for this problem. In addition, in addition to having a, this neat closed form, form solution for probabilities, right? So that basically you are projecting to a set. Okay, so one, one uh, uh, distance that is natural to choose is the Skorohold metric. The Skorohold metric is basically the supremum norm. It, the, it's just the supremum norm just changed a little bit. Because uh, what happens with the supremum norm is you, you can have two things that, um, that look really close, like any reasonable person would tell you they are close for paths that are discontinuous, like something that looks like that, right? This and something that looks, something that looks like, like this. And so if you, allow me, if you allow me to match these jumps here, now they would, they would align perfectly. So if you allowed for tiny perturbations in time, uh, and you account for, for those in the distance, 
that then you basically have the supremum distance, right? So it's just, you just need to you allow perturbations in time, but also pay a supremum norm there. Okay, so. Uh, okay. Yes, if xt and yt were continuous, this should be exactly the norm, right? But, uh, but since I'm taking this example of the ruin and the data comes in discrete time, and because I want to show you the numbers when it comes, when it's like a compound Poisson process with Pareto tails and everything, so you can see that this surprisingly gets it right, then I need to include the case of jumps. Okay. Sorry? Only, only in the Cadillac, sorry? This, this type of metric is defined on Cadillac processes, right? Which, uh, so right continues with left limits, which is what in the data happens, right? Whenever an arrival comes, at that point, boom, you jump, yes. Uh, you would have to, one would have to check that, uh, so in this, sorry, the theorem also says it has to be a poly space, so this is a poly space. I could have used the supremum norm, but that doesn't make, that, this, that unfortunately that space is not a poly space, and so the theorem doesn't apply. That's why I have this, okay? That's why I pick this. Um, I think, so I have uh, uh, what, uh, I think I, I'm going to stop here, right? It's a good time to stop. I'm just going to uh, just uh, summarize. So what, what we are after is now I'm going to assume my, the, my, my process, uh, which is the reset process, it follows Brown emotion, and I'm going to compute this, this uh, uh, exactly this probability and then check with numbers to see what happens. Right? So the last talk is going to be then do this for machine learning problems and, uh, and connect to statistics and that's it. The number what? Uh, so the these numbers. Yeah. So yeah, this is this is the number. Like this is this is the this is if you have gone with this model naively, and uh, you are seeing that you are estimating the probability of ruin by an order of magnitude like ten to the twelve. But if you do, if you change the you 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 need to use some hill estimator for your the tails of your of your. Um, Claims and if you use a small variation, time you don't have to get it right, but you do a tiny, you know, two instead of two point two, so you make a mistake, a little bit of mistake, and you use this cost function. Now the value, the order of magnitude is bounded by ten. So that means now uh, this makes a lot of sense. This is the following: there is a, something that is called solvency two. Solvency two is the requirement for insurers to to uh, guarantee capital requirement. These uh, guys, they want the insurers to satisfy capital requirement with probability of 0 0.005, probably five in 1,000 probability of uh, bankruptcy yearly. It's really impossible to do that non-parametrically. Yeah, you, you need like uh, thousands of, uh, or tens of thousands of yearly data to guarantee that. But if what you think is that what the insurer really wants, he, what the insurer is thinking is like, he, they are going to pick this model, and I'm going to robustify, and I'm going to get it off by a magnitude of 10, then really translates into 0 0.05, not 0 0.005. So then you need tens of thousands of years for data, and that makes sense. Okay. So I'm going to stop here.